Okay, so uh, this is a, a video. I'm going to go over uh, section uh, six in the microbiology class. For uh, it's, it's about microbial growth, um, and these are uh, things that you need to consider when you're growing bacteria and media: sulfur, phosphorus, hydrogen, nitrogen, sodium. And these are sort of the places where bacteria might find them. And this is uh, E. coli, what it would, uh, um, if you look at how much of the bacteria is protein or nucleic acid or carbohydrate, right, this list there, their weight and percent. So in order for bacteria to uh, eat, they need to get the food inside the bacteria, right? So they absorb it. Sometimes they need to digest certain molecules like starch or proteins first. So they would use things like amylase or gelatinase to do that. But the, those enzymes would have to be secreted into the media, broken down, and that would allow the bacteria to absorb them, right? They have to be small enough to get into the bacteria. So passive transport is the way bacteria would get you know, things that don't require energy into them and they would use active transport to get things into the bacteria that require energy. This is uh, the bacteria growth curve. And just to quickly explain what happens, if we start uh, a media and say without any bacteria, it's sterile, and we added a certain number, say like a thousand bacteria to it, that those thousand bacteria, it would take some time for them to acclimatize to the media. So this is a on this y-axis is the number of bacteria in the in the media, and then this would be over a time period of say 40 hours. So for for the first five hours in this tube, they're saying that the number of bacteria would remain a thousand. It, it, they're adjusting, they're making enzymes, they're, they're getting ready, absorbing material to eat and stuff like that. But once they get to a certain time point, then they, they begin to divide. That's what growth is, right? For bacteria, when they grow, they grow in number. So, right, they, they grow what's called log or exponentially. That just means very quickly, right? This is actually a logarithmic you know, scale here. So for, you know, maybe 15 hours, their number goes from a thousand to a million or three million or 10 million. Probably 10 million could grow in a tube like that. But then at some point they begin to stop growing in number, they start to die. So the stationary phase, then you say the growth, the number of bacteria that are dividing or you know the new bacteria are the same number that are dying so the numbers stay stationary and then at some point they really just stop dividing altogether at that point right they've got too much they don't, they don't have enough food or there's so much waste in there that you need new fresh media so you would you would take some bacteria from this tube and put it into a fresh tube right that's how they maintain bacteria, a stock culture of bacteria in the micro lab. So it takes E. coli about approximately 20 minutes before it can divide into two bacteria. And that's because it has to replicate all of its DNA, right? We talked about DNA replication. So they use what's called binary fission to reproduce. And they, you say their reproduction is an asexual process as well. So if we wanted to enumerate bacteria, right, we could filter, say, a liter of water and run it through the, a filter that looks like this. So these are the white guys are bacteria, individual bacteria, and the black dots are holes in the filter. So the water goes through the hole and traps the bacteria on the filter. When you're done filtering a liter of water, then you can put it on a food source for them, and then they divide and grow into colonies. So each colony represents one bacteria that was left on the filter. 
that give you a rough idea of how many bacteria were in that liter of water. Another way of doing is doing, it's called plating method, where you do what are called serial dilutions. So you take the original inoculum, you dilute it one to 10, then you dilute this one to 10, then you dilute the one to 100, one to 10, to get one to 1,000. And then you put a mil or so of this media, the liquid media on the plate, a mil of this on the plate, a mil of that, and then you let the plates grow you know, so if there's a bacteria left on the plate, it grows into a colony. So here there's too many colonies to count, too many, too many, and then you get to a dilution point where you can actually count the colonies. So in this last plate, there's four colonies. If you multiply four times the dilution factor, which is 100,000, then you'd have approximately 400,000 in the original <coughs> inoculum or um, temperature and growth so all the different I don't remember exactly where I left off but we'll start here the so what we're going to do in the remaining part of this section is go through physical requirements required to grow bacteria so temperature will be the first and on this figure it shows, right, we've got the, how many bacteria are growing on the y-axis, and this is at various temperatures. This is about five degrees centigrade, which is about refrigerator temperature here. So these, the blue line shows bacteria, a group of bacteria that grows best at that temperature. If it's a medically relevant bacteria, those would be bacteria that would grow best at 37 degrees. Right, that would be the green line here on the PowerPoint. They're called uh, mesophiles, right? So that's all, you would say all normal flora would belong to that group. I don't expect you to memorize all the different names for these. That's not important to know, remember. I just kind of want to give you a concept of you know, 37 degrees, if we, we had a curve like this, at the top of the curve, you get that, the best growth. But even if you went out to say 39 degrees or 40 degrees centigrade, or you went the other direction and down to 35 degrees centigrade, the bacteria still grow at those pretty well, right? You have to get way out at the either end. And they're not symmetric, right? They stop growing after a certain temperature, right? They'll, they, they, they survive better at lower temperatures. <clears throat> but so there's a maximum and minimum and an optimum temperature for right, bacteria. So there are five, four groups here. Like thermophiles are the only, say, you might find them growing in a hot tub, right? If there were a bacteria problem, you know, those would be the, the, you'd call them thermophiles. So in this depiction, right, what happens is you want to, you want to add bacteria to this media while it's liquid, and then you would stir it up so that you evenly distribute the bacteria in the tube. The media solidifies when it gets to a right, the right temperature, right around 40 degrees. And then the bacteria are stuck in place. At the top of the tube, you'd expect the oxygen to be relatively high. Whereas at the bottom, you'd expect the oxygen concentrations to be lower, right? There'd be a gradient. And then you let the bacteria grow and see where they grow. The black dots indicate, right, they're growing at the top in this tube, and there's nothing growing at the bottom. So that would suggest that they need oxygen or they're aerobic. Right, just aerobic bacteria. 
you'd expect to be where there is oxygen available for them. Facultative anaerobic bacteria, right, it's not aerobic, it's facultative anaerobes. They would grow all the way at the bottom and at the top, right, because they're not dependent on oxygen. They can grow with it or without it. Then you have the third one. These are obligate or strict anaerobic bacteria. So you put an AN in front of that. They grow without oxygen. Okay. So and this is the list. Now, I didn't mention these two. Uh, don't worry too much about uh, tolerant, aerotolerant, or microaerophils. I won't ask you any questions about them. But there are other groups of bacteria with different, in a different, ca different category. So aerobic bacteria require oxygen. Facultative anaerobes, these are where the enteric bacteria fall, right? Enteric bacteria are bacteria that grow in your gut, intestine. They're normal flora. So those tend to be facultative anaerobic bacteria. They can use oxygen, but they don't need it, which is good if they're in your intestine. There might not be a lot of oxygen there. Just depends. Now, the strict or obligate anaerobic bacteria, an example of that is Clostridium. That is a genus, right? That's why it's italicized on the PowerPoint. Clostridium perfringes causes gas gangrene. It's a strict anaerobe. So, catalase and superoxide dismutase are two enzymes that are necessary, I think we learned right at the, at the electron transport chain, oxygen is converted to water. Occasionally though, the oxygen doesn't become water, it becomes the free radical instead. Oxygen free radical. So whenever you're using, even in our mitochondria, they produce free radicals as well, just like bacteria will. And we need these enzymes to neutralize the free radical, right? You can, so you'd say SOD, superoxide dismutase neutralizes oxygen free radicals. Now, it only converts them to peroxide. So peroxide isn't too good either, especially for bacteria. It's a very good disinfectant. Works pretty quick. So you need catalase that enzyme as well, right? Just having superoxide dismutase isn't really enough. So they would both be expressed when bacteria are using oxygen as a final electron acceptor. So bacteria that do that are aerobic bacteria. Right? That's the definition. Oxygen's being used at the electron transport chain. <clears throat> so peroxide is neutralized, another way of putting it, or converted to oxygen and water, which are very safe. <clears throat> You're back to the oxygen that you started with. So you need both of them. Now when we do the catalase test, for lab, right? It doesn't have its own little unique uh, media that it's used, right? We just use a TSA plate. 
But if they're positive for catalase, then you could argue that they're probably using aerobic respiration. And that's why. That, that would, this is the, the logic. Now, the other way of getting rid of oxygen-free radicals are taking antioxidants. That's why antioxidants are saying, you know, they're considered to be healthy for us. If we have these oxygen-free radicals, if they're not getting rid of as quickly as they're made, they can oxidize DNA, proteins, and other things in our body that aren't healthy to us. If you oxidize DNA, it's mutating the DNA. You know, so vitamin C, right, one of the benefits of taking it would be to, if you, knew, if you oxidize proteins in your brain, right, they could, that could lead to Alzheimer's. You know, so that, that, that's one of the theories behind why, you know, you, you know, what happens with Alzheimer's is our proteins are they're denaturing because of oxidation or other things, and then they, they stick together and form plaques. And they're not supposed to do that, right? So the, the brain cell will die eventually if too many of those plaques form in the cell. We don't want that to happen. So then we have uh, pH. All right, that's another physical requirement. We talked about temperature, we talked about oxygen. So pH is the measurement of hydrogen ions. And the cinephile would be a group of bacteria that require an acid or a low pH. So like, we're talking about like in the neighborhood of two to three, that's what the two to three is, the pH. If they're not at that low pH, then they don't grow well, right? You could even put on here, instead of temperature, you could say pH of 2.5. So if it gets up to, uh, say around here, it's pH 4 or a pH of 1, right? Above 4, they just won't grow. Now, if you're acid tolerant bacteria, what they do is they might be in a pH of 2.5, right? But that's not their optimal pH, right? It, it looked more like this. They want to probably be at more of a pH of uh, four or five. But if they're in two, if they're in around two, they can tolerate it. Or they're in your stomach. Helobacter pylori grow in our stomachs, but they grow in the mucosa, and the mucosa may not get to the low pHs that the stomach contents gets to, right? Because they're kind of protected in the mucus. The mucus helps protect the, the stomach of your, the lining of your stomach to some extent too. But Helobacter pylori are not acidophiles. That was the point I'm trying to make with the graph, right? They they don't require an acid. They prefer to be at a, you know, a, a higher pH. pH of five is still acidic. That's for sure. Right, and then if you make pickles, right, that's basically a cucumber. You put in acetic acid or vinegar is acetic acid. So you put them in there to preserve the cucumber, right, before the refrigerators. They preserve food this way to kind of keep them, I don't know uh, how long you can keep a pickle unrefrigerated, but I imagine it's pretty long. Then a medically relevant bacteria would grow best most of the time at around pH 7. So most of the media that we um, use in lab are at a pH of 7. Right. Enteric bacteria are in that category of medically relevant. That just means the bacteria that cause most of our infections. You know, that's what a lab's going to do, right? If, you, if they get a sample from you, whether it's urine, blood, skin, wound infection, they're looking for 
medically relevant bacteria, right? That's the ones they expect to find. So osmotic pressure is another physical requirement. And we want to keep the bacteria media at a relatively normal osmotic pressure, which if they're a halophile, it, it would actually be a very high, right? Because the more salt that's in the media, the higher the osmotic pressure gets. But it's not just salt. It's also sugars or proteins or even lipids and fats. All of them that are in the water contribute to the osmotic pressure. So when you speak of halophiles, you would put it in this category because these are bacteria that love right, high salt. Most bacteria, you know, say medically relevant bacteria, right, are, most of the pH in our body is probably um, not the salt concentration or, you know, it's normal saline is 0.85% salt. So it includes more than just sodium chloride. It could get a little bit higher than that. But when we use the MSA plate, then there's 7.5% sodium chloride, which would be a high salt, but you would also think of that as having a high osmotic pressure too. But they, they like to be in that high salt environment, right? They've got, you know, evolved to live in that, right? So our, our skin where you find Staphylococcus is pretty salty. I'm pretty sure that's why my dog licks my my legs, right? He wants to solve them. I think that's why they do it. Not because he likes me, for God's sake. So if you would include sugar, both high sugar concentrations, if it was too high in the media, they wouldn't grow in the media either. So when you want to make preserves, the word tells you, right, it's to preserve fruits. Same with pickles. They wanted to keep you know, grapes around long or berries or whatever. They just threw a lot of sugar in the fruit. They, you know, this would be before there were refrigerators. Right, they couldn't keep it. Even the refrigerator doesn't keep fruit that long, <laughs> actually. But I've kept, you know, I've had jam in my refrigerator for five years and it still looks good. You know, I mean, nothing's growing on it. So I assume it's okay. Beef jerky. Another example, I don't think that's spelled right. So, you have to put chemicals, right? That means they have to have a carbon source, they have to have an oxygen source, they need nitrogen, they need sulfur or sulfate, phosphorus, that can be phosphate, can be in it. Right, they're important components you have to consider. Now in this, I guess you could think of it as a recipe, in one liter of water, you would put five grams of glucose, one gram of ammonia phosphate, five grams of sodium chloride. That'd be kind of high salt, I think. Magnesium sulfate, and you would know exactly, every time you made it, exactly what you put in it. Now, the water will contain all the micronutrients like zinc, iron, selenium, any little things that you, if you looked at a multivite, there's a lot of metals in there. You think, why would I want, you know, iron? You know, you know why you need iron, but other metals are in there too. So you don't, when you, when your water source really shouldn't be purified water or deionized, it ought to contain, you can make it too. I've known labs that may use water that was so pure that no bacteria would grow on the media because they didn't have all the other things in it. But the abundant ones are in, there are lots of them in this. Glucose would be the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Right? It contains all, all three of those. But they're the abundant. So anything that's other than those four are not abundant elements or chemicals. 
This would be a chemically defined media. I'll get into that in a minute. So in the lab, we, we discussed the concept of a broth. TSB is triptych soy broth. And triptych soy is a soybean extract. Soy is just means that you 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 made a smoothie with soybeans and then dried it down. And then you buy it as a dry powder, and you can buy it in the store, soybean. You know, it's a, it's got it's rich in protein and it has lipids in it. And, you know, basically you can live off of soybeans, right? It's got everything. Maybe not all the vitamins, but all the I think you get all the amino acids that you need and all that. So bacteria love it too. You put this extract to make all of these. If it's triptych soy, it could be a plate, uh, TSA plate, TSA slant, or a deep tube. A broth would be TSB without the auger. The auger makes it solidified, right? And we sometimes just call things like the starch auger plate, or it could be just the starch plate. If there's auger in it, then it's sometimes you just include that in the name, right? It's mannitol salt auger. If you don't have auger in the name, it doesn't mean there isn't auger in it, but if it's liquid, it definitely doesn't have auger. But that's just a side note. The other one's what EMB, that doesn't have eosinmethylene blue, that doesn't, but it's eosinmethylene blue auger would be, you know, a name for that, or you could just say eosinmethylene blue, but normally pour eosinmethylene blue plate. If you want to do an oxidation catalase test, there's not a name for those, there's not a media name for those two. We just take bacteria off the TSA plate to do the test. But the plate, if, we, if you have a lab, right, and you have a plate of E. coli that you're going to use for that lab, it would be kept on a TSA plate or a slant. You're not going to do a biochemical test unless you're performing the catalase and oxidase test. If you wanted to put them on an MSA plate, then you're doing a biochemical test and you're asking a specific question. So there are chemically defined media, like I mentioned here. That means you, you, know, you add a specific amount of water to a weighed out ingredients. You know exactly what it is. The triptic soy auger, or triptic soy broth, right? This stuff is a dry powder. You, add, you, know, you just add water to it and autoclave it, and you've got triptic soy auger, or triptic soy broth, right? It's, you could make uh, a similar by adding the beef extract to water, and you could have a beef extract plate. Might add auger to it, beef extract auger, a yeast extract auger, or casein extract. All of these, this comes from yeast, casein comes from milk, where you know, if they're making milk, producing, you know, or cure, whatever they do, processed milk from cows. They can make casein extracts from the leftover milk or whatever, however they do it, right? But milk has plenty of proteins and lipids and everything, so bacteria can grow in the, they're called undefined because each time you make a batch of it, you don't really know exactly, they don't measure and weigh everything that's in it. It's probably pretty consistent, but that's what we mean by undefined or complex. So if you wanted to grow a bacteria that was an anaerobic bacteria, that could be a strict anaerobe or an obligate anaerobe, then you would want to use the anaerobic chamber or candle jar. It's a, the final glycolate broth is a little bit different because it doesn't, in this, uh, 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 it's not auger, it's a broth, but in that media, there is still some oxygen in it, and it, it may not grow obligate anaerobes. But if you make use a candle jar, what you do is you, you inoculate the bacteria in the media you want to test them with, and then light the candle, put the lid on, and when the candle goes out, 
you know, you, you're no longer have very much oxygen in there. I'm not sure. There might be a little bit. Yeah. It says you invert the petri dishes. What is inverting the petri dishes have to do with oxygen? Yeah, it's not because it, you, you invert petri dishes normally. That's the right practice. So when you store them, you store them upside down? Yeah, that's the way, you know, students don't always do that. But technically, yeah, if you're working in a lab, you're less likely to get it contaminated because the cover really, things, if you have it the other way around, it's still, it still, it also has something to do with the condensation. The condensation will get on the top of the lid, but normally you keep it upside down. You want, you need to get, it, you know, on this one it doesn't matter. Well, it does too. You want to get rid of the oxygen in the petri dish. So you, or even these tops here need to be loose because air needs to be able to get in and out. If it needs oxygen, then you want it to be able to get in and out. If you want to eliminate the oxygen, then you'd want to be able to, you know, so media is always open air. And you always think about how you're going to minimize contamination by keeping the plates upside down or there are other ways of doing it. But that's, you know, normally if, you, if you're if you new to micro, you know, like if somebody starts working in the micro lab, they're probably going to have contamination issues for a while, you know, while they're new. Did you learn how to prevent that from happening? You know, like in lab, I'll see students all the time. They take the lids off the plate and then they just leave the plate on their desk with the lid off it. That's not the, that, that's not, you sh it should always be upside down on the lid and when you take the bacteria you put it right back upside down. Now the anaerobic chamber is the same principle uh, but you don't have a, you don't have a jar, right, but you have some sort of chamber that seal tight and then you put in a gas generator which converts the oxygen to CO2. So I put up here an example of Clostridium perfringes, a strict or obligate anaerobe. It causes gas gangrene. The C is for Clostridium, right? That's the species. So selective and differential media is, this is, this comes from the lab PowerPoint. Uh, all right, there's the purpose of it. Mainly this is for lab. But I'm gonna just discuss the difference between differential and selective. If a media, when you describe it as being differential then it gives you the ability, like on the MSA plate, if the plate turns yellow, it's probably staph aureus. If the plate doesn't turn yellow and the bacteria grows, then it's probably staph epidermidis, right? Why is it differential? It's based on a fermentation of the carbohydrate. A selective media just means, is there something in the media that inhibits bacteria from growing. So we put 7.5% sodium chloride, that's the salt, that's the inhibitor, that's what makes the MSA media selective. Right? And enrichment media, I really don't have too many, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the BAP plate as an enrichment. So here's the picture of mannitol salt, auger, right? It's used to determine what type of skin infection you have, mostly. If you get a wound infection on somebody's body, then the micro lab would always use an MSA plate. If it turns yellow, then the boil or the infection is caused by Staph aureus. That's what you would infer. You would consider this differential based on the fact of mannitol fermentation, whether it's fermented or not. What makes the MSA auger or plate uh, selective 
is the high salt sodium point. So you have three outcomes, right? No growth. If it doesn't grow, then you know it's not Staph aureus or Staph epidermidis. So it's even that's a little bit differential. But anyway, it's an inhibitor. If they grow, then the salt didn't inhibit the growth. That means it's probably Staphylococcus aureus, right? That genus is, it, when it comes to medically relevant bacteria, it's usually Staph aureus that will grow on this plate. There are other bacteria that can grow on it, and probably maybe one or two medically relevant bacteria. I don't know them off the top of my head, but that would just mean that they tolerate that high salt. Right, so that's why, you know, I say sodium chloride inhibits most bacteria, right, because it's pretty high. Then we used Makaki, we then used EMB, right, those are the acronyms, Makaki auger, eosinophilene blue. They both grow enteric bacteria, so if bacteria grow on there, it might be an enteric bacteria, right, and there's a list of them, you don't really need to know the list, but <clears throat> now if they grew, they, they didn't get inhibited, because there are inhibitors in both of these, then the, uh, if the colonies become pink to color, then they fermented the lactose in the media. So you could say, not so much with the EMB plate, but with the McConkey plate, right, lactose fermentation in the pink colonies makes McConkey differential. Now I told you before, to do the catalase test, there's not a specific name for the media, like there's not a catalase media, right? You just, you just need the bacteria growing. So TSA plate is the, the plate that we use. I think if you did your principle for this in lab, I would expect to see in the principle TSA plate is used. Minus one if you didn't mention that. The, the reagent that's used is peroxide. You add a drop to a colony, and then you see this bubbling, then it's positive for catalase. Then it also tell you that those bacteria are probably using aerobic respiration. All right, and then there's the starch plate and the gelatin tube. Now the, the thing that they, those two have in common is they're testing for the ability of bacteria to secrete enzymes, right? Either secrete uh, amylase for the starch plate or to secrete gelatinase for the gelatin plate. If they can secrete gelatin, then they, they break down the gelatin and it turns to a liquid. All right, you can jiggle it in it. You see a little bit of li liquid in there. Now the starch plate, on this plate here, this is a starch plate, they inoculated E. coli, you can kind of see the white look to it, right? It's not quite, like it's a little bit there, there's like a long line. And then they inoculated bacillus, all right, there's a big, all the white area here is a, a big clump of, you know, it's like a bunch of colonies growing together. So that, the white area is the bacillus bacteria, and the white area over here is the E. coli. They've grown, and then if they secreted amylase, then they broke the starch down on this plate. But you can't see that until you add the iodine. Right? The iodine stains the starch this dark color. So before you add the iodine, it, the media looked this color here. And then you add the iodine, and then that the, the clear zone, see, kind of, it's like a halo around the bacteria growth. So a halo is a good description of it. And that tells you that in that clear zone, the starch was converted or broken down to glucose by the amylase. And it's clear, you know, E. coli grew on the plate, but they didn't break down the starch. 
because there's no clear zone around them. All, there's still star, in fact, stars there, wherever it's dark. Now, the, if you let this plate go, before you add, like, let's say we waited a day before we added the iodine, if we give it another day, the, the zone would grow, it would get bigger. But you would, would they be. Stop, would they stop once Yeah, once you had the iodine. Now, you know, it may still continue. The iodine, well, iodine probably would not be too healthy to the bacteria. Right, because it's a disinfectant. So I think at that point you'd probably have killed most of the bacteria. Not all of them, right, because you never really kill them all. But you probably would stop the process. Although, whatever amylase was secreted would still continue to work. So it probably would grow to some extent. Because the amylase, it, it, you know, you don't use it up. It, it can last for a long time in that medium. And it just spread out would be my guess. So that's that plate. Then the last plate we're gonna look at it's called BAP. Now in the lab, there's no P and P for, for, for this particular media, but it will be on the quiz and it will be on the practical. Just want to make that clear now. But the BAP stands for blood. So what we do is we take uh, sheep's blood and add, it's like a 5%, um, and it turns the media a nice red color and you can't see through the media when you do that, right? It makes it so it's not transparent. You can even see, you know, this B here, the beta. You, you could, if you can see the other side of the plate, you can see through the plate. You can't really see it too well in that picture. But you get a clear zone. There's actually an alpha sign. You can barely make it out on this projector. And there's a gamma sign too. So, there's three types of homolysis that bacteria produce. All right, so there's three different bacteria. There's one that's making alpha homolysis, there's one that's generated beta homolysis, and then there's a third one that's made gamma homolysis. If you, were, if you wanted to know if somebody had a strep throat, all, you know, the, the doctor can do a rapid strep test in the office, they normally have to follow that up in the lab, and then what they would do is take your swab and inoculate a plate. If they saw beta hemolysis, then you might have strep throat. A fastidious bacteria is a bacteria that requires a media like BAP. So there are different examples of auger like BAP, like maybe extracts might be considered a, a uh, <clears throat> what do we call it here, it was a enrichment media. Okay, that would be another way of describing a media that fastidious bacteria need to grow on. The media needs to contain growth factors, vitamins, or amino acids that isn't present in, thing in the medias that we normally use, right? So if, unless those specific growth factors and vitamins are present, then the bacteria won't grow. But that's the definition of fastidious. Okay, any questions? <coughs> 